Hello, welcome along to the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan. Thank you for listening to us this week on the greatest podcast in the universe. Absolutely the only podcast that discovers all the secrets of the universe. This week we'll talk about an animal with one of the most painful stings ever. And seriously, I cannot believe we haven't spoken about this yet. We've been doing this show for like a few years now, spoken about so many weird and dangerous and deadly creatures, but this one hasn't come up yet. You can find out more in a little bit. Also, we'll talk about one of the strangest and shortest space missions ever. And we've got your questions today, uh, all about the internet, about snakes and about diamonds. I'll get to those in just a sec. First, let's catch up with one of our favourite superheroes on the show. This is K-Mystery. K-Mystery. Elements in danger. Hey, guys. I've been learning a ton of stuff about some elements in danger. With a bit of help, of course. Well, chemistry superhero alter egos have their uses. Do you know how many people have a smartphone? Mm, I don't know. Several million? More like billion. Over two billion people currently have smartphones that they use. And that number's only going to increase. And let's not forget that some people have more than one phone. Well, that's a lot of phones. And with many people upgrading their phones roughly every 11 months... That's even more phones lying around in a drawer or cupboard. Did you know that less than 10% of phones get recycled? Oh, that's so sad. That's not sad, it's mad! We've seen that gold is used in the circuit boards in our phones. Well, gold in its raw state is found in gold ore, which has to be refined to get pure gold that we use, which is a bit of hard work. Now, we could get 300 times more gold if we recycled one ton of smartphones than if we refined one ton of gold ore. Like, wow, we are literally just throwing gold away. That is mad. So I'm going to set you a challenge. Eating a whole pack of Oreos? I'm down for that. More of a treasure hunt. I want you to count all the gadgets in your house that are no longer used. And then I want you to say how you could reduce, reuse, or recycle them. Cool. Let's do this. Get set. Three, two, one, go. Um, I'm in the living room. There's a smart TV, but we're still using that. I guess there's a games console we haven't played in ages. Maybe we could give it to a charity shop or sell it so it can be reused. Good call. Next up, the kitchen. Mm, there's Mum's tablet. She uses that for her recipes. The screen's cracked, though. She was thinking of getting another one. I guess I could suggest she gets it fixed. Repairing is a great idea. A new screen will use fewer elements than a whole new tablet. Oh, I found my brother's old phone in his drawer. Could someone reuse it? Mm, it's so old, it won't even switch on. I think that's one for recycling. OK. Now let's check out your bedroom. There's like a whole bunch of stuff in here. Oh, I've got this toy watch which has games on it. Like it's for small kids, so I don't play with it anymore. Does it still work? <laughs> Looks like it. One for someone else to reuse? Oh my gosh, there's like the tablet I had when I was like six. Oh, that won't switch on anymore. And the screen's cracked. Recycling it is. Well, let's check out mum and dad's room. Mum just uses her e-reader as a phone now. I'm going to ask if I can have it. Great reusing there. OMG. Dad's got like four, no, five old mobile phones. Oh, he gets a new one every year. You know, I could suggest that he makes them last a bit longer. And some of these still work and some don't. So it's a mix of recycling and reusing. Good job! You've found loads of gadgets that you aren't using, all containing valuable rare elements. Whilst the elements might be rare, having so many unused gadgets is pretty common. Most households have at least one gadget they're not using, and it's not uncommon to have many more. But how can I recycle gadgets? I mean, you can't put them in the recycling bin at home. Definitely not! There's loads of charities who'll be happy to recycle your phones. Just take them into their shops 
or check out RecycleNow.com for other places you can send them. You can ask your school if they're recycling their gadgets too. Start a recycling revolution! And helping out, well, means I'm a chemistry superhero too, just like you. Well, no one is just like me, Karina, but you'll be the next best thing. Thanks, K-Mystery. K-Mystery, elements in danger. With support from the Royal Society of Chemistry. Find out more and get hands-on with chemistry at funkidslive.com slash chemistry. It's question time, question time. My favourite part of the show is question time, by the way. It's if you've got something sciencey rattling around your brain, if you desperately want to figure out the answer, let me do a little job of trying to find it for you. You need to leave it as a review over on Apple Podcasts. Charlotte has done that. She is seven. She's in Kefili. And she wants to know, how does the internet work? How does Wi-Fi reach our houses through the sky? It's always something I've wondered, actually. Um, I think I need to get a proper Wi-Fi expert on to tell us more about this. I've got a little bit of an answer, but I reckon we need a Wi-Fi expert. Uh, It's all about the language that computers understand. It's binary, um, where where everything is broken down into a series, into series of ones or zeros. There are really two options in that language. Something's either off or it's on. Now, the data in the Internet is converted into loads of tiny packets Loads of them for just one file. They contain tons of these codes of ones and zeros. Now, these packets are then sent through the air on radio waves, which are then picked up by your computer, uh, who take all of these packets and they put them together. So, I mean, think of that. A lot of work goes into you hearing what I'm saying now. Uh, I, the, the, the computer converts it on my end to ones and zeros. It flies through the sky and then is picked up on your end and then unscrambled. It's just amazing. It's a little bit mind bending. I'm going to try and find a proper expert for you, Charlotte. Uh, next up is Ralph, who is also seven years old, who wants to know how snake bodies move. Well, they rely on muscles and scales. The scales, by the way, they're made of the same material that makes your fingernails. It helps them slide over different surfaces. Normally they slither in a wavy line, don't they? Kind of wriggling from side to side in an S shape. The muscles they have, it pushes them forward and then backwards, forward and then backwards. The scales that they've got, they grip onto things in front of them and that helps yank them forward as well. Um, That's kind of the answer. I think we'll move on. Don't really like snakes. Uh, Also, lastly today, we've got one from Orion, who is six years old over in New Zealand. I've just realised there are quite a lot of questions from New Zealand. If you've sent me one and you're a bit annoyed that I've not answered it yet, it's because I've only just found I could go to New Zealand on the podcast store. I'm going to try and do that in the next few weeks, I promise. Anyway, Orion asks, how are diamonds made so strong? Now, diamonds are made of carbon, which is an element, and they're made under a high temperature and under huge pressure deep underground. They're squeezed, they're pressed so tightly that the atoms bond together. And they're so strong because it's incredibly hard to break those bonds. That's why they're so precious, so rare and so valuable as well. Thank you so much for the question, Orion, and a brilliant name to boot. If you've got something sciencey that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it for me as a review over on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, some gigantic marks in the ground have been found in a rock on a beach in Wales... And there are signs that they might be dinosaur footprints. To find out more, uh, we're crossing to the National Museum of Wales now to speak to Cindy Howes. She's a paleontologist there. Hey, Cindy. Hiya. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, we love dinosaurs, so um, I want to kind of build to this. How were the, um, what might be footprints, how were they found? Uh, Well, uh, We first have reports of footprints down there being found in 1879, but we've never seen them since, so we don't know exactly what was found at that point. But just recently, in the last three or four years, we've been spotting them when we've been down there on field trips. So they're quite obvious at times, but at other times, the beach, the waves, they cover them up with pebbles, so we don't see them then for a year or two at a time. What do you mean you first saw signs in 1879? That's, 100, that's 150 years ago. What's, been, um, what's happened to them since? Were these sets of footprints, were they confirmed beforehand? Why has this not been bigger news? 
<sighs> well, at the time, there were some very definite footprints being found over uh, near a bridge end, um, and, and those were the more important ones. And there was a report in, 19, in, in 1879 that just said, and we found some others at Panath, but, but they were very, very minor things compared to these fantastic ones we've got from Bridge End. So since then, we've been sort of looking for them, but nobody's known quite what they looked like, exactly where they were found. Uh, then in 2009, um, a few colleagues of mine um, did a, a bit of exploratory work uh, down at Panath and found a, a surface which did appear to have footprints or something similar to them in. Uh, and then they got covered up again for a few years. So nobody saw them again until about four years ago. Uh, and at that point, we sort of started thinking there might be something in this. And we seem to have been able to see them ever since. But we're still investigating exactly what they are. Now, everything you say is just firing off more questions. So I'm, I'm sorry, we might be here a while. Um, you say they get covered up again. Four years yes. ago, you found these. Uh, probably really silly question. What are they being covered up with? Oh, just that the beach level changes rapidly. So these footprints are preserved in solid rock at the very uh, the bottom part of the beach, uh, you know, underneath the pebbles, underneath the sand. And occasionally the storms will sweep all the sand and pebbles away and then it reveals the rock underneath. And then perhaps next winter, the storms bring more sediment back in and cover them up again for another few years with a, a foot or two of, of mud or sand. So we don't see them. Now, what are you doing? What are you looking for when you're dinosaur footprint hunting? Are you just throwing a dart into a Welsh beach, a map of a Welsh beach and thinking, oh, we'll start there? Or is there something a little bit smarter going on? What are you what are you trying to figure out? Well, we've got to find rocks which were actually exposed to the air when they were made. There's no good looking for footprints in rocks, sediment, sand, mud or anything that was that was formed and laid down initially under the sea because things don't leave footprints on the bed of the sea. They've got to leave footprints on a muddy shore or around the edge of a lake. So it's got to be rocks that were actually um, originally deposited on dry land or semi dry land mud, really. Um, so we're looking for rocks of that sort of age. And there aren't that many in Wales. Uh, there's this little time period uh, just before the, the start of the Jurassic period. Everyone's heard of the Jurassic. Um, but before that, we've got the Triassic period, which stops about 200 million years ago, at just about the time when the sea level rose up and covered South Wales for good. Uh, but before that, we've got lagoons and mudflats and desert conditions. And at times here, you've got these muddy shores around lakes where the dinosaurs or, and other reptiles as well were walking around, leaving these footprints in the mud. And that's what we're looking for. Rocks that were laid down in these, uh, in these muddy conditions, but on land, not under the water. Now, when you finally find what you think might be a footprint, to your eye as a paleontologist, what signs are there that this might have been made by a dinosaur? Well, what we're looking for mainly is, is the shape, but not necessarily only the shape. You, you look for a trackway, a set of footprints. So the shape is sometimes quite diagnostic. You can see fingers, toes, claws, but sometimes the mud is a little bit softer and just leaves a bit of a squelchy hollow with an irregular one. So then you'll start looking for marks of the same size and shape, which are laid out in a trackway. So what you're looking for at this point is a consistent left, right, left, right trackway, which is made by an animal walking. Uh, and if the stride length is the same between these, you can imagine that that might be where an animal has walked. If they're totally random and you get too close together, then two or three that are sort of splayed way apart, then it's not going to be a trackway of an animal walking. So what we're looking for more than just one single print of a right with the right uh, number of toes is a trackway uh, where you can see this animal has actually walked. Now, you've, you think you've spotted that this is where an animal has walked. Um, are, are, are the footprints pointing towards it being a specific animal at this point? What do you think it is and how do you know that's what you think it is? <laughs> that's where it gets confusing because um, you can never be totally certain unless you actually find the animal or the remains of the animal in the rocks 
alongside the footprints. You're never certain what's made those footprints. If you think about the animals on Earth today, uh, especially the equivalent to dinosaurs, we've got birds and crocodiles and such like, they all make very similar footprints. One variety will be the same as the other. So it's the same with dinosaurs. Lots and lots of dinosaurs will make very, very similar footprints and you just can't tell. So we just Man, we, we just work out the general shape of a dinosaur. We think, oh, it might be bipedal, it might be quadrupedal, whether it walks on two legs or four legs. You can see that. You can see how many toes it's got, possibly uh, two uh, three, three toed or four toed, possibly. Um, and you can tell an approximate. Uh, size of the footprint and you can you can measure an approximate stride length which gives you the size of the animal so we tend to call footprints that we find after a general type of animal rather than the specific animal and and now you you, you kind of got an inkling what this animal is who finally but it's not been classified yet. it's not been decided has it who, who who's making the decision now that these are actually dinosaur footprints well, we've got a little team we've put together, uh, a couple of researchers from the Natural History Museum, one from uh, Liverpool, from the University at, at Liverpool, um, and myself, there's a couple from Cardiff University. So we're all going to get together, hopefully, uh, as soon as our Welsh lockdown finishes, uh, down on the beach at Penarth and, and really study these things in detail and decide whether or not they are made by a dinosaur or whether or not they're made by some other reptile, there were lots of other reptiles around at the time, or whether or not they just possibly might not have any sort of organic origin at all, uh, because there are minerals which uh, form on the beach and they could possibly be forming in clumps and forming hollows in the rock which could look a little bit like footprints. So that's where we need to start studying whether there's a regular pattern and distance between them and we think that they actually are at that point uh, footprints of something like a dinosaur. So so we've got a little team of, at the moment, about seven or eight different people we're hoping to pull together to finally decide that uh, in a few months and and last question what will it mean for your understanding of dinosaurs and their place in the welsh environment if these turn out to be officially dinosaur footprints well, it'll be brilliant because, you know, we don't have a lot of dinosaurs in Wales. We have a couple of fossils, um, one from lower, uh, from beds lower than this one, so older. And we have a Dracoraptor, which was found a few years back, which is from beds that are higher than this. We don't have anything from this specific age. Um, we also have a few footprints from along the coast, but we don't have any defined from, from this area. So it'll tell us what sort of animals are living on this sort of coastline, in this area, what the environment was like. So these, if there were dinosaurs living here, it wasn't a very harsh desert environment. There will have been things for them to feed on. Uh, there will have been environments they could live in. So it's going to tell us an awful lot about what type of dinosaurs there were in the area and how they could live and the other animals that were living alongside them one, one last question i'm going to sneak in because something you've just said has, has made me think of something you mentioned that you don't have a lot of dinos in wales um how many dinosaurs at the peak of di i know this is really hard to say at the peak of dinosaurs they were around for hundreds of millions of years um but at the very busiest moment of all the dinosaurs how many do paleontologists think that there were Oh, there were probably thousands and thousands of different varieties of dinosaurs. We haven't found a fraction of them yet. I mean, at the, the current rate of play, we are finding one new type of dinosaur a week on average around the world. So, you know, if we're still finding that sort of level of dinosaurs, just think how many more there will have been to find. So you think of current biodiversity in life around the world and, and take that back and think there must have been thousands and thousands and thousands of different species of dinosaurs in different areas and it is so rare for a fossilization to occur that we just haven't found anything like the, the, the bulk of them yet and all of the dinosaurs and all of the different species together are we are we thinking mi millions of creatures Ooh, who knows? I mean, not all of them would have been dinosaurs. There are all sorts of weird and wacky animals from back then, which most people would not even be able to, you know, comprehend. There are all sorts of things. They just haven't been in the envir environments which have been fossilized. So, um, you know, dinosaurs are just the half of it, really. There are lots of other things that we haven't yet found, too.
Right. Uh, well, I'm going to let you go, and I, I'm going to pull together a list of every question I've ever wanted to ask a dinosaur expert, and, and, <laughs> and I'll get you back on a bit later in the year, Cindy. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much for joining us, all right? Yeah, that's fine. No problem. It's been great. Now, for this week's Dangerous Dan, we're talking about an insect with one of the most painful stings ever. The paper wasp is quite a menacing looking thing. It's dark red normally with some yellow stripes around it. Now they're named after the stunning nests that they make. They look like they've made them from paper. They build them on roofs and uh, in door frames as well. Uh, And they love them. They love their nests. They love them so much that really the only time they get aggressive is when they defend them. When someone disturbs their nest, they come out for revenge. Their sting is extremely painful. It's a burning pain. Some people can be allergic, which makes them even more deadly. Now, when they sting, and they can sting repetitively, by the way, they release something called a pheromone. Uh, And a pheromone is kind of like an alarm that warns other wasps. And then they realise there's an issue. They come over and they attack you more. It can cause huge pain, severe reactions, uh, swelling, itching, burning, redness, and sometimes even death. And anything that causes that much damage has to go on our Dangerous Dan list, including the paper wasp. Let's travel back through time now and get another Age of the Dinosaurs. Age of the Dinosaur with Dinosaur Action Magazine, the number one mag for dino fans. Welcome to the Jurassic period which existed between 145 and 200 million years ago. With the supercontinent Pangaea continuing to separate, more and more big watery lagoons were forming, and along with the new oceans, were teeming with life, from the tiny to the monstrous. Wow, so many animals, but where are the dinosaurs? Dinosaurs didn't live in the sea, but all of the first creatures to appear on Earth did. On the seabed, you would see sponges that looked like squishy lumps, tiny corals that were building huge rocky reefs and starfish. These animals had been around for millions of years before dinosaurs and are just like those you'd find on the beach today. Hey, look at that huge shellfish with wavy tentacles. Cool. That's an ammonite. It's a close relative of squid and octopuses, whose ancestors had already been around for 150 million years before the first dinosaurs appeared. They came in all sizes. Some were as big as two meters wide. The hard shell protected its squishy body, and its tentacles were used for swimming and catching food. Quick, get out of the way! Something big's coming! Make way for a plesiosaur, one of the Jurassic period's biggest beasts. Plesiosaurs were sea creatures with tubby bodies, four flippers, and a short tail. Some had long slender necks and small heads, while others had huge heads but short, powerful necks. They were both agile and terrifying. Some of the biggest, like Liaplorodon, were at least 10 meters long. That's nearly as long as a bus. They had sharp teeth that could be over 30 centimeters long. They were the top predators in the ocean feeding on whatever marine reptiles and fish they could grab. Let's get out of here. Away from the oceans in the watery lagoons lived even more sea monsters. Fast fish eaters like the ichthyosaurs were dolphin-like creatures with a tail fin and four flippers. Temnodontosaurus was a massive ichthyosaur, over 10 meters long with huge eyes that helped him see in the gloomy water. Since ichthyosaurs didn't have gills, they couldn't breathe underwater and had to come to the surface to breathe, just like whales do today. Paleontology. Pick. Fossilised skeletons don't just tell paleontologists what creatures look like. They can tell us a lot more. For example, From fossils of pregnant ichthyosaurs, we know that they gave birth to live young in the sea. No fossils of pregnant plesiosaurs have ever been found, but we know their ancestors laid eggs, so they probably came out on land to make nests, a bit like turtles. Age of the Dinosaur with Dinosaur Action Magazine, the number one mag for dino fans. (laughs) 
It's time for this week's Science in the News. Now, NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has touched down on an asteroid 330 million kilometres away. It's been up in space for ages, trying to make contact with an object called Bennu. And it touched down for 10 seconds and then gathered some rock even though it was only there a little time. It's a huge deal, science, it's scientists are saying. It's really important because Bennu, they think, is about four and a half billion years old. And the scientists think that the rock might have some clues to the secrets of the universe. Also, Britain's newest polar ship, the Sir David Attenborough, well, you know, was meant to be called uh, Boaty McBoatface, that one. So it's left to finally head to the North and the South Poles. Uh, it left on Wednesday. It's getting the once over by engineers to check that it's OK to support the UK's scientists before it finally goes on its big mission. And finally today, three scientists have been awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize for Physics in their work understanding black holes. The scientists are from all over the world. They were announced as this year's winners at a news conference in Stockholm. Uh, Now, black holes is what they've been working on. They are regions of space where the gravity is so strong that not even light can escape them. And throughout history, uh, these scientists, they've helped us understand them better. Uh, So they're getting a Nobel Prize for physics. Well done, them. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for listening. Um, If you've got a science question that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it for me as a review over on Apple Podcasts. While you're there, it's one of the best places that you can hear loads of series that we do. Science ones, ones about history, ones about jobs, ones about space. We've got it all on there. Uh, Also, you can get them on the free Fun Kids app at funkidslive.com. And Fun Kids are a children's radio station from the UK. You can listen to us all over the country on your DAB digital radio on that free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com. 